Hello, friends, and welcome back to r slash pro revenge. Today, we have another epic tale about Karen and her boyfriend, Kenny, this time. Subscribe to our channel if you're new here, and don't forget to turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. Woman damages my mom's car and blames my mom. Okay. For some background, I live in a predominantly suburban town in New Jersey and my family's Asian. One of our neighbors, let's call him Anthony, is a retired police captain from another town, but he's friends with my town's police chief. My mother's a first-generation immigrant, and although she's fluent in English, she still has a pretty thick Asian accent. A couple years ago, my mom went to visit one of her friends on the other side of town. My mom had parallel parked directly in front of her friend's house, which is at the bottom of a small hill. As she was leaving, a woman driving a Jeep Wrangler with her children was driving down the small hill, but she was still a decent distance back, so my mom pulled out of her spot. The road they were on was really wide, with enough space to fit five cars next to one another, and about 40 feet ahead was a stop sign. My mom at this point was already in the middle of the road, fully out of the parking spot, and had gotten about 10 feet when the woman driving the Jeep suddenly came up behind my mom's car and cut directly in front of her, crossing a double yellow line to do so. Because of the angle she cut off my mom at, the Jeep's rear wheel ended up ripping off my mom's front bumper. My mom naturally immediately stopped, and the woman got out of her car after straightening it out on the road. As soon as she stepped out of her car, this woman, we'll call her Karen, immediately starts cursing my mom out at the top of her lungs. Karen told my mom to call the police, but my mom told her that her phone had died. My mom's friend and her son, as well as the neighbor, came out of the house after hearing the commotion to see what had happened. The neighbor, an elderly man, asked what had happened, and Karen yelled, Are you effing blind? A effing accident happened. Go call the police. I need to call my boyfriend. The son had taken a law class in college, so he offered to take a bunch of pictures of the scene of the accident and send them to my mom later. This becomes super important later. The neighbor calls the police, but Karen's boyfriend arrives at the scene first. When the cop, let's call him Kenny, finally arrives, he asks my mom what happened. Just as my mom had started saying her side of the story, the cop says, wait just a minute, and walks over to the boyfriend. It turns out the boyfriend, we'll call him Sam, was a cop in the town who was pretty popular with the kids in the middle schools since he would occasionally visit to talk about things like D.A.R.E. and some other things in assemblies. Sam was off duty at the time, so he was able to come over when Karen called him. As soon as Kenny saw his bud Sam, he immediately went to go talk with him rather than with my mom or with Karen. They discussed for a little while and afterwards sent everyone on their way. My mom tried to talk to Kenny before he left, but Kenny just brushed it off and said he got the details he needed and that my mom would be able to get the police report in about a week or two. When my mom receives the police report, she saw that it said she pulled out without using her blinker suddenly and hit Karen's car. On top of that, Karen was expecting for my mom's insurance to pay for the damage done to her rear wheel. My mom went to my neighbor Anthony to ask what she should do about the report since it was clearly wrong. Anthony was furious and told her that she needs to go to the police station and ask to see the chief, and if they ask what she needs to see him for, she'd tell him that it's because she wants to file an internal complaint. That day, my mom takes the photograph sent to her by the son and goes to the police station and asks the person working the front desk to see the chief. The cop says that she could not just walk in and ask for the chief, so my mom responds, okay, so where should I go to file an internal complaint? And the cop immediately straightens up and says, right here, come with me. He leads her into the back. The deputy chief steps into the room and started recording the conversation. Since the chief was out, my mom presented all of the evidence to him instead. After presenting the evidence to show that it was in fact Karen that hit her instead of the other way around, my mom also says that she would like to file a corruption complaint against both Kenny and Sam. Kenny clearly did not do his job properly since he did not properly ask the actual people involved in the accident and did not even note the fact that there were two passengers in Karen's car in the report. Even Karen later admitted to an investigator that Kenny never spoke to her once. My mom even threw in the racist card for good measure, saying maybe Kenny wouldn't listen to her and brushed her off because of her thick Asian accent. Sam, meanwhile, had interfered with the investigation despite not being at the scene of the crime during the time of the accident. The deputy chief says he will start an internal investigation and will see if anything needs to be done. 
Meanwhile, my mom also filed a claim to her insurance and presented the evidence to them too, and her insurance decides since the accident, in their eyes, was clearly not her fault, they weren't going to pay Karen a penny and that they would contact Karen's insurance to pay my mom instead. A lot of internal bureaucratic investigational bullcrap happens, including interviews with Karen, my mom's friend, and the friend's neighbor. About a month passed, and an officer comes to our house to tell my mom that Kenny has been punished, but there was not enough evidence to punish Sam, and he wanted to know if there were any other concerns she had. Since Karen seemingly had not done anything to further warrant any action and the damage to the car was paid for, my mom said that there was nothing else. This is the fun part. Three days after the officer came to our door, a letter came in the mail for a court hearing. Turns out Karen decided to file three tickets about my mom just one day before the statute of limitations. Apparently in New Jersey, citizens are allowed to file complaints about other citizens breaking the law, a thing that our family had never heard of before until this happened, and because of how late she filed these complaints, by the time we received them in the mail, we could not even counter-complain, and the only options were to pay the fine or go to court. We assumed that Karen learned about being able to file a complaint from Sam, because no crap, and that the only reason she was willing to go this far is because she heard my mom had a super thick Asian accent and assumed that my mom wouldn't know what to do about the tickets and would just pay up. What she didn't count on was the fact that my mom is actually really aggressive, with an absolutely massive network of people that she knows. Within a day, my mom hired a lawyer to fight the case, and they immediately asked to change the court from the small court in our town to one of the large courts a couple of towns away. The logic was that if she fought the case in our town, my mom would be at a disadvantage since her case was essentially going against our town's beloved police force, and by putting it in a different town, the playing field would be even. Additionally, while my mom worked from home in her own business, Karen had a full-time job in town, so going to court in a different town would be a huge pain in the butt for her. The lawyer had prepared a huge amount of evidence against Karen, so there was no way she was actually going to win the case no matter what. Come the court date, Karen never showed up, so the case was thrown out. That was a pretty nice win, but what came after was even better. Since my mother and sister have a lot of friends in town, the story of Karen and Sam doing this shady bullcrap got out really fast. Soon half the town had heard about it, and suddenly Karen and Sam went from two favorites in the town because of Sam's reputation to two of the most underhanded and nasty people. Sam stopped getting invited to school assemblies, and Karen was ostracized in her kid's school's PTA. Anthony also ended up talking to the police chief in private, and we found out that although Sam was not officially punished, he was severely reprimanded by the chief. And our next story. Don't F with Sergeant Jesse. This is a story about my father's deceased friend, Jesse. Jesse died before Reddit, but he told me this story, and I thought I'd share it. Sergeant Jesse was a black man, about five foot two, but with a really wiry build, total dynamo of a guy. Sergeant Jesse came back from Vietnam in E7 and was placed in command of a group of white soldiers who were led by a bunch of E6 good old boys who couldn't handle having a black man give them orders. Jesse didn't care, he just did his job. One day, Sergeant Jesse bought his wife a new Cadillac with white wall tires and he drove it on base his first day to get his DOD window sticker. The car was parked in their company's parking lot where all the NCOs parked, and much to his surprise, when he returned, all four tires were slashed. The E6s were all curious and asked, what are you going to do? Could have been anybody. Are we going to question the whole company about your wife's tires? By the way, how you getting home? Snicker chuckle. The only thing they didn't say was, boy. But it was understood that they thought he was going to have to either raise a huge ruckus and become a distraction to command right as he just got there, thus diminishing his reputation, or just eat this and keep on going. Jesse didn't play that crap. He just said, I'm not going to look for who did this. He's going to come to me. As first sergeant, Sergeant Jesse could authorize field training exercises and PT at his discretion. He called the company to order and told them they were going on field training exercises immediately. They were ordered to grab only their GI-issued gear and be prepared to overnight for several days. Then he walked them out into the woods for about 10 miles and told them to set up their tents. After they constructed the more permanent tent with a wooden floor and portable stove for him, he posted a guard at his door, lit a fire in the stove, and went to sleep. Did I mention it was December? And that everyone else was sleeping on the ground in pup tents with no heat? 
So the exercises began. Jesse ran them like rented mules for two days through those woods. Long morning and evening runs, push-ups, pull-ups, lunges, digging latrine trenches in frozen ground. You know, team building. Camaraderie inspiring torturous bullcrap. After two days, one of the E6s showed up with two black eyes, looking like 10 pounds of crap shoved in a five-pound bag, as Jesse would say. Apparently overnight, the company pulled a code red on his butt and beat on him until he agreed to confess because they were damn tired of living in the woods in winter. Jesse docked the man's pay and made him replace the tires, but didn't file charges against him because he thought he'd paid dearly enough. And more importantly, Jesse had made his point for everyone on base to see. Don't F with Sergeant Jesse. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video, and I'll see you in the next one.